Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 4G. We're going to talk about gene interactions. First, we're going to consider a case where genes act independently. They don't interfere with each other's effects on phenotype. And then we're going to consider situations where alleles of different loci interact with each other in their effects, so that sometimes the presence of a particular allele at one locus prevents us from knowing which alleles are present at another locus. And in this lecture, we'll start with a simple example of a simple biochemical pathway. Now, first, though, to think about an example where alleles of different loci act independently. And for this, we're going to go back to thinking about the ABO locus that affects which sugars are which sugar modifications are placed on the surface of red blood cells. You remember from module 3 that there are three alleles, A, B, and O, and that A and B cause different sugars to be produced on the surfaces of red blood cells. O puts no sugar on. There are six possible genotypes and four possible phenotypes, the phenotype being an antibody test that detects which sugars are present. So both A, A homozygotes and AO heterozygotes are type A, um, B, B, and B, O are B, O is type O, O is type O, and A, B heterozygotes are blood type AB. Now we're going to think about another locus that also affects the presence of antigenic molecules on the surface of red blood cells. And that's the locus called D. D has two alleles, which are called plus and minus. And the plus allele is responsible for the red blood cell modification that's commonly called the RH factor. And when one's blood is typed, not only are we checked for A, B, and O antigens, but we're also checked for whether or not we express the RH factor antigen. And we're described as being Rh plus or Rh minus. Now, even though both of these genes affect processes that are happening on the surface of red blood cells, they act independently. So the action of the D alleles is not, the consequences of the D alleles is not changed depending on which A allele is present. So in combination, we've got three ABO alleles and two D alleles, we need to be able to think about how many different genotypes are possible and how many blood type phenotypes are possible now that we're considering not a single locus in isolation, but we're considering two loci that act independently. So we can calculate the number of genotypes and the number of phenotypes that exist because the, when these two genes are acting independently, so we have six genotypes from the ABO locus, AA, these are diploid genotypes because we're diploid, AB, AO, BB, O, and OO. And we have three genotypes at the D locus. We have plus plus, plus minus, and minus minus. Now, we don't have this many phenotypes because AA and AO have the same phenotype, A, and BB and BO have the same phenotype, B. So we have four different phenotypes um, under the ABO locus, and we have two different phenotypes under the D locus because the homozygote and the loss of function heterozygote, both will express the antigen and be typed as Rh+, plus. only the minus minus homozygote will be minus. So we have a total of 18 genotypes. For each of these six ABO genotypes, we have three D locus genotypes, plus plus, plus minus, and minus minus, but we only have eight phenotypes because we have four red blood cell phenotypes and two, four ABO phenotypes and two RH factor phenotypes, plus and minus. Now, 
That's a case where genes act independently, the, where the consequences of the gene's actions are independent. But in many cases, alleles at different loci interfere with each other's effect on phenotype. Um, here's an extreme example where you could imagine that an allele that caused hairlessness, um, for instance, an allele that caused baldness in men, may make it difficult to tell what color of hair that person would otherwise produce. So their hair color alleles are unknowable if there's, no, if there's a separate mutation causing there to be no hair. Now, we're going to think about this first in biochemical pathways. And we're going to start with very simple biochemical pathways where we have two genes responsible for two biochemical steps. The first step takes a precursor, a small chemical molecule, what we call a metabolite, and gene A produces an enzyme, enzyme A, that converts this precursor molecule into an intermediate molecule. So precursor is the substrate for the reaction catalyzed by enzyme A, and the intermediate is the product. But this intermediate then serves itself as the substrate for a second reaction catalyzed by the products of gene B, which we're calling enzyme B, producing the final product from the reaction. Now, what we want to think about is the consequences of mutations in these genes on the phenotype that we can measure, which is, is the product present or not? So first we can consider a mutation in gene B. And if this is a loss of function mutation, but only in one allele, we expect we'll see a fairly normal phenotype because we still have one functional copy of the gene. If, however, both alleles carry loss of function mutations, then no enzyme B is going to be produced. This reaction won't be catalyzed. There'll be no final product. What about a mutation in gene A? Again, if it only knocks out a single gene, a single allele, we expect normal pathway. But if both alleles are knocked out, there will be no enzyme A. This reaction will not happen. There will be no intermediate. And as a follow-on problem, because there's no intermediate, this reaction won't be able to proceed either. There will be no product even though enzyme B is working perfectly. Finally, what if there are loss of function mutations in both alleles of both genes? Well, again, we're not going to make any enzyme A, so this reaction isn't going to happen. And the final product won't be produced for two independent reasons. First, because there's no intermediate, and second, because there's no enzyme B. So the consequence of a double knockout of two genes phenotypically at the organismal level when we look for the final product, the consequence of mutating both genes is the same, the phenotype is the same as the phenotype associated with mutating only gene A. So we could say that mutations having two mutant alleles of gene A masks the effect or covers up the effect of mutations in alleles of gene B. From the phenotype, we can't tell how well gene B is functioning because gene A isn't functioning. Now, I'm going to put this on a slightly more realistic level, and then there's a couple of problems to solve. So we could think of a pathway where, in fact, the final product, the green product, is a pigment that's present in aphids. This is an aphid on a leaf. And the green pigment makes the aphid the same color as the leaf, makes them difficult to see, difficult to be eaten by predators. Mutation in the first step of the pathway, blocking this step, causes the intermediate to accumulate. It's actually not, not only still be made, but it will actually pile up because it's not being converted to the product. And aphids with these mutations are pink. If gene A is knocked out, then only the precursor is present, and the aphids are colorless. They're white. Now, here's a genetics problem. 
The aphids on your roses are normally green, but you find a pink one. What could its genotype be? And you should assume, for this case at least, that functional alleles in these genes are fully recessive, fully dominant to defective alleles. So there are two answers that are right to this question, and they actually overlap in what they describe. So the most comprehensive answer is this one here, that the aphid, because it's pink, it must be defective in gene B. It must have two defective alleles of gene B. It must have a functional be able to carry out this step. So it must have at least one functional allele of gene A, but we don't know what the other allele would be. And you'll notice that I'm using a representation that I introduced um, a few lectures ago that we can write A dash to indicate a genotype where we know that, a big, that the A plus allele is present and we don't know what the other allele is, or it doesn't matter what the other allele is. Another correct answer is A plus A plus B minus B minus. So this individual could have two functional alleles. This genotype is actually included in this genotype, but they both are correct answers given the way the question is worded. Now, here's another question. Again, the aphids are normally green, but you find a white one. What could its genotype be? So again, we have two answer choices that are correct. Um, you'll notice also that I've switched in the way that I'm representing the, the alleles. In the previous problem, I wrote them as A plus A minus. Now I'm writing it them as big A, little a. And it's okay to do this, to use this shorthand nomenclature, because we've been told to assume that dominance is happening here. So we can write the recessive allele, use the little a symbolism to represent the recessive allele. Now, as I said, there's two correct answers. The individual could have, must have a defect in gene A. This pathway, this step must be blocked because no pigment is being made. But because this step is blocked, there are different, all of the possibilities for the B locus are possible. The individual could be big B, big B. They could be big B, little b, both of which are included in this symbol here. Or the individual could be completely defective at both loci. We can't tell if there's a functional B locus, B allele present because there's no functional A allele present. So, we've considered phenotypes where two genes act independently, and then we've started to consider phenotypes where the phenotype caused by the action of one gene depends on what alleles are present at another gene. Um, we've diagrammed really only one type of metabolic interaction so far, and analyzed the effects of defective alleles, and we've used phenotypes to predict genotypes. We could do this because we knew the underlying genetic basis of the process that caused the phenotype. Now, coming up next, we're going to think about some more complex effects in biochemical pathways. I hope to see you there.